friends so good evening so today i'll be talking on this uh, airway pressure release ventilation so if you recall i had done already one video on uh, advanced modes of ventilation so in that i had not covered couple of uh, newer modes like nava and aprv so it is a very brief overview on uh, certain principles of airway pressure release ventilation so not sure how many use this regularly i have not used this very often Uh, so just go through the salient aspects of this uh, airway pressure release ventilation. Uh, this APRV is present in few of the commercially available ventilators like Drager, Revita, Puritan Bennett 840. And uh, in our ICU, we have uh, GE. So we do have APRV mode in that and we have tried in a couple of patients. So what is APRV? So in essence, APRV is providing differential CPAP at a high level and at a very low level. So it is a little similar to BiPAP, but there are certain differences which I will talk about. It is an open lung ventilation. So what is open lung where you give a high peak with low tidal volume in ARDS typically we use. So as the name suggests, it's an open lung. So we give a high CPAP level and as the indication would possibly strike your mind since it's open lung, the indication is typically in ARDS or in atelectasis. So it's very easy. So it's an open lung inverse ratio. Obviously, when there is an inverse ratio, there is a CO2 buildup, there is a auto peep that happens, and it's pressure control. So this is the characteristics of airway pressure release. So as the name denotes, there is a high amount of uh, uh, pressure support that is delivered intermittently, and it is time cycled. And then there is a short release of this pressure to a very low pressure. So you give a high pressure up to say 30, which we'll talk about the nuances of this. And then we suddenly drop the pressures to almost zero or maybe up to five. So there is a differential sort of a pressure that you create uh, that leads to recruitment of alveoli and clearance of CO2. So that is the whole principle. So if you look at this uh, graphical representation, so there is a buildup of uh, pressure during and so you up to 30 centimeter of water then there is a sudden drop so it can go up to zero because if you take this as a mean pressure you drop the pressure to zero to five and this helps in elimination of co2 and the rise in the pressure mean airway pressure up to 30 or we'll talk about what how do we set the pressures so that will help in recruitment of the alveoli so the obviously with this effort by increasing the pressure, you will increase the mean airway pressure. And this increase in the mean airway pressure is helpful in recruitment of the collapsed alveoli. So the indications of airway pressure release ventilation typically would be atelectasis or ARDS or diffuse bilateral pneumonias where you need good recruitment of alveoli. So that is the principle of airway pressure release ventilation. And it is also shown to reduce the villi because here you are playing with the pressure. You are not playing with the tidal volume. Really is ventilator induced lung injury where harm to the lung is caused due to the volume trauma due to the increased tidal volume that you deliver which leads to over distance of alveoli which is not the case in this because here you are using a differential pressure. High pressure followed by a sudden drop in the pressure up to zero for a very short time that leads to a differential pressure leading to recruitment of alveoli and mitigation of villi. So that is the principal characteristic of APRV. And what is its claim? So this APRV was introduced sometime in 1987 or something. It claimed to be useful in management of ARDS because of, especially only in spontaneous breathing, because you create a differential pressure and it is like a BiPAP, so there has to be patient's effort. So it will allow the patient to breathe spontaneously in ARDS at a high pressure, and it helps in reducing the asynchrony of the lung. Uh, so the synchrony between the patient and the ventilator would be much better because you are using this in a spontaneously breathing ARDS patient. So what about clinical evidence? So we have a lot of studies and I will show you. Uh, there are two meta-analyses. The most recent one came in 2021. There are at least around seven to eight small studies. All studies have shown that it tends to improve the oxygenation and maybe help in reducing the length of stay. But overall, there are no studies have shown mortality. And this is typical in most of the advanced modes of ventilation. So no studies conclusively show that they have a great bearing on improving the 
outcomes with regards to mortality. So just a little difference as to if you uh, recall this curve uh, as to how we set the peak in ARDS. So we know we look at the pressure volume curve and we look at the lower inflection point uh, from so, so the pressure just two centimeter above this lower inflection point is what is needed. So if you see here, the alveoli are derecruited or there is atelectasis. Two centimeters above this particular lower inflection point, when there is an uptake of this pressure volume curve, is when then the alveoli, alveoli gets recruited. We know this. We have spoken in the previous uh, videos in ARDS management. So here, at around maybe 14, the alveoli is opened up. And then there is this upper inflection point where beyond which there is an over distension of the alveoli. So you, you would set the peep somewhere between this. So in APRV, so you are sort of a pressure are set somewhere in this range as compared to the volume control. See in volume control, you set the tidal volume. So there is the, vol the volume control ventilation tends to be hovering around the upper inflection point because you set so this is the point from where the alveoli, we keep two centimeters or we reduce the pressure a little bit below the upper inflection point until your compliance comes down or your saturation comes down as the optimal peak. So in volume control, there is always a sort of a uh, argument that it could lead to over distension of alveoli because of the volume that is being delivered. So your APRV appears to be safe because it falls exactly between the upper inflection point and the lower inflection point. So that is the claim with APRV. With volume control, the claim is that you tend to over distend the alveoli because of, uh, uh, you know, the pressures exceeding the upper inflection point. So what is then the difference between CPAP and APRV? So in CPAP, there is an equivalent amount of pressure both during inspiration. If you see the characteristic of this waveform, the CPAP or the pressures are same during expiration and inspiration. And end expiratory pressure is usually limited to around 5 centimeters of water. But in APRV, so you take this up up to 30 centimeters. So end expiratory pressure goes up to, you increase it to up to 30 centimeters of water where the recruitment of the alveoli happens. And then you suddenly drop the pressure to zero or you for a very short period of time. And this helps in clearance of CO2. So this helps in CO2 removal. So that's the difference. So here, the, the pressures during inspiration and expiration are the same. But here, there is a differential pressure. So the expiration, you increase the pressure up to 30. And then you suddenly get the pressure down to a zero or up to five centimeter, which leads to carbon dioxide removal. So this is the principal difference between the CPAP and the airway pressure release. Then the argument is, is APRV same as BiPAP? So there are certain differences between APRV and BiPAP. So if you look at this curve, so the green one, what you see is the BiPAP and the square one is for, is the APRV curve. So the, the T high is longer in the APRV and the T low is, I'll talk about T high and T low, is uh, T low is smaller in APRV. And it is opposite in BiPAP. In BiPAP, the T high is smaller and T low. So it's exactly little opposite. So the time at the peak is much longer in APRV. And uh, the T low is narrower in APRV. I'll just show you the differences in a tabular form. So what are the key differences between BiPAP and APRV? So BiPAP, it is time cycled and the trigger is the time and so is the case in APR. It is little similar with regards to trigger. It is time triggered and it is time cycled, both BiPAP and APRV. And the targets are always pressure. Both BiPAP and APRV work on the pressures that you set and the volumes are determined by the patient. So that, that remains the same between both BiPAP and APRV. Spontaneous breath, I'm sure every listener would agree that BiPAP, spontaneous patient will be breathing spontaneously and patient is allowed to breathe anytime. In APRV, in, in addition to patient's own breath, there can be mandatory breaths also that will be provided by the APRV mode. And the IE ratio, this is, a, this is a significant difference. In BiPAP, IE ratio is normal, inspiratory, expiratory, but in APRV, it is an inverse. Because of the pressure differential, there is an inverse IE ratio. 
and that can lead to carbon dioxide buildup and autopsy that happens. And as I mentioned, the P low uh, in BiPAP, we keep it at a higher level. Uh, it it will be lesser than obviously there is an inspiratory positive airway pressure and the expiratory positive airway pressure. So the P low is almost zero, and we spoke about it. P high we go up to thirty, and the P low it comes to zero or up to five. And auto peep in BiPAP is very uncommon, but APRV because it's an inverse ratio, and uh, you put up the pressures to at very high levels. So there is a recruitment of alveoli and there can be buildup of CO2. So CO2 buildup and auto peep is very common in APRP. Okay, now coming to, we, we spoke about the characteristics of uh, APRV, which is two differential pressures that you keep. So what are the settings that we keep? So the settings is very simple. So, and this was APRV, I believe has been asked as a short note for DNB. So it is important to at least remember the salient points. In APRV, there are four settings we do. Obviously, FiO2 we do. Then P high and P low is for you. And we have to set T high and T low. So T high and T low is the time as to how long P high remains. And how long the P low remains is what T high and T low is. And we saw the T high is longer in APRV. T low is shorter. But in BiPAP, it's the opposite. T high is smaller than uh, what is in APRV and T low is longer. So that is the key difference. And I'll show you in the uh, waveform as to how they look. Setting parameters, as I said, how do you set P high and P low? So we've been speaking theoretically because we said that APRV functions between the lower infection point and higher infection point. We said that, isn't it? So where should be your P high? So P high and P low, P high should be just below the upper infection point and P low should be just above the lower infection point. So in a very simplistic sense, there are two studies to determine what should be the settings that you should put on a ventilator with regards to either you look at the pressure volume curve, look at the upper inflection point, just below that will be your P high number and look at the lower inflection point, above it will be the P low. If you do not want to remember this or you think this is more cumbersome, the easiest way is to check the P plant. So, and there were two studies, Abashi et al. in 2005 and Zoe et al. The simplistic way is you put the P high at the previous P plant. You check the P plant and put it at that. That's why I kept using the word. We can go P high, we put up to 30 centimeters of water. Because plateau pressure, we keep it less than 30. So you check the P plant, just put at the P plant. And that is your P high. And P low, and I said P low is, unlike BiPAP, we put it to the lowermost. Either you put zero or Zhou study. Zhou study, which came in 2017, which called as, and they call it as a Zhou protocol, or Habashi protocol, they put it at 5 centimeters of water. It's a very simple. So you put P high at the plat, P plat that you measure, and P low, you put it very, very intuitive, you put it at 0 or 5, not more than that. And T low, as I said, T low is smaller than the uh, in BiPAP. So T low should be terminated at 75% of peak expiratory flow rate, and Zhou et al. suggested it should be 1 to 1.5 of the time constant. So I won't go into the details of time constant, which is more physiological. Time constant is the product of compliance and resistance. And it is the time to complete the, the whole lung volume or uh, uh, lung capacity. And it is around with one time constant, around 68% uh, of the lung emptying tends to happen. So that is more physiological. But the easiest way, the default sort of a T high and T low is what we tend to set up. So if you look at uh, the waveform, so this is the P high. So you see this is the P high where you put it at the P plateau pressure. And P low, you would put it at zero. And here, as you see, it is little above. So you may have kept it at five centimeters of water. And T high is the time at which it remains at high pressure. So T high, so the default setting is uh, the respiratory rate should be kept at 8 to 12 and not more than that in APRV. So it should be in the range of 8 to 12 breaths per minute. That's why there is a possibility of CO2 to build up here. So T high, we put it at 4 to 6 seconds. And T low, as I said, it will be smaller than BiPAP. We put it at 0.6 to 0.8 seconds. And this will create auto peak. 
So these are the settings. So very simple. So P high, you put it at the P flat. P low, you put it at zero or max five. And T high, four to six seconds. And T low, you can put it at 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 seconds to create auto P. But T low should be always smaller. T high is always longer. In bipad, it is opposite. So the T high will be smaller. Not opposite, it is lesser than this. But T low will be longer than what we keep in APRV. So if you write this in exam, I think this is good enough. Write this waveform. Put the default settings. I think that would uh, that would depict that you have a good clarity on the understanding of APRV. So now very quickly we'll talk about the studies. I won't go into the details. So these are all the small studies. As you see, studies started way back in 1994. As I said, APRV came at around 1987. Then it went out of vogue and then it did come in because it did get incorporated into the newer ventilators. So all small studies done in 18 patients, 30 patients, and this is the late 58 patients. All these studies showed that it did show better oxygenation, and some studies showed it reduced the length of uh, ICU stay. And uh, uh, so, so this was the, with regards to smaller studies. And then there was this most recent meta-analysis which came in 2021. It took all these studies and uh, so six trials, and uh, they looked at so six, six trials of 375 patients. So they looked at day three PO2 by FiO2. So APRV with APRV, the PO2 FiO2 was much higher and that was statistically significant. And mortality, with regards to mortality, there was no difference with regards to APRV and other modes of ventilation. And ICO length of stay was significantly reduced with regards to APRV as compared to the other modes. And the median difference was mean difference was 3.4 days and it did attain statistical significance. So the indications for APRV, as I said, the whole functioning of APRV is recruitment of alveoli, creating a bit of auto peak. So the indications is fairly intuitive. You don't have to memorize. Intubation, uh, the indications is acute lung injury, ERDS, atelectasis, and diffuse pneumonias. And contraindications, because it creates auto peak. There is a huge differential because you are taking CPAP up to 30 centimeters of water. Obviously, COPD, asthma, you don't want auto -peep. So they are the exclusion. Pneumothorax would be a contraindication or hemodynamic instability is a contraindication. So if you understand the physiology, you don't need to memorize. So the contraindication is hemodynamically unstable because you are creating an auto -peep and a very high CPAP. So hemodynamic instability can happen. COPD, severe asthma, restrictive lung disease, you do not want auto -peep. And pulmonary artery hypertension and right heart failure, it is a contraindication because it increases the afterload of the RV. And for me, the contention is APRV possibly may not be helpful for ARDS because increasingly we are recognizing that in ARDS, during the weaning phase, there is already RV strain and pulmonary artery hypertension that tends to build up. So RV is already over, is under tremendous uh, sort of an overload. So for me, APRV becomes a problem because PAH and right heart failure uh, is a problem in uh, severe ARDS. So we, I am not sure how much this mode will be friendly with regards to from that physiological standpoint. So that is my argument that this may not be a great mode for severe ARDS because already pulmonary artery hypertension and the RV dysfunction may be setting in, which, which is increasingly being recognized. And traumatic brain injury and neurosurgery, obviously, because you don't want high CPAP, which is a detrimental for these patients. So that's about APRV in a very simplistic way. So most of the points that are needed for answering a question in the exam is what has been covered. And, and if we know this much, that's good enough. I have not dwelled into the detailing of uh, the time constant. Uh, so, because that is more physiological way as to how we set the T low. Uh, so, so you, so you can read about it, uh, uh, but T low is just to keep at this whatever default setting 0.6 to 0.8 seconds. That should be good enough. So, thank you one and all. So, I request all our listeners to submit their valuable work to the journal, Journal of Acute Care, which comes out every three months. So, you can visit my website, uh, www.drpradeepangapur.com to read to this. So thank you. Thank you, Anand.